I was about to tell you some other things about Sunday, and that is uh, that uh, we finished uh, even the, like a mini-series that I called the ABCs of Salvation. As I'm studying the book of Galatians, uh, it's starting to get a hold of me more. Uh, at the beginning, I, I just picked the book of Galatians because it's one that I had written down that I needed uh, to go through. We ended our studies that we were talking about, about prayer and all, so it was time to study a book again. But anyhow, so the last couple weeks in preparing Galatians, it didn't quite, I just doing it out of routine more. Uh, uh, but then reading it through, it's starting to get a hold of me again, where I start seeing all the value in this book. And the reason I'm saying that to you is uh, I'm thinking as I'm going through, even, you know, just keep reading it and looking at it over and realize where it's going and what it's teaching, is I keep thinking of some of the new people that we're seeing on Sunday and how valuable this is that they need to hear. <laughs> we have a few less people here. It's not that you're, some of you are more established. Uh, but anyhow, I'm just thinking as a whole, so many different new people coming in on Sunday uh, that I thought, man, since I don't really know where I'm going next on Sunday morning, I should have I taken Galatians and made it the Sunday morning <laughs> series. And, uh, and you'll find out within the next month probably where I'm going on Sunday. For a while, we just, pick a, just preach a message uh, until I get some directions on, on what series or what it's probably time to teach a book again even on Sunday. Uh, that's usually what I do is I teach a book and then during the time that I'm teaching a book I'm thinking of, there's always different things that come up that need to be dealt with or taught and so I keep a list of that and then I cover all those things and then when they run out I go back to teaching a book again and uh, I, I've told you before that uh, when, I, when I first was elected pastor by the way November past was uh, 33 years uh, but uh, but I remember coming into church, had no office or nothing, and I just reading through Timothy thinking, okay, what do I do? And the Bible says, preach the word. And I thought, wow, that's easy. <laughs> now, it's not easy to preach the word, but it's, I don't have to look for a topic. You know, I always wondered how preachers pick a topic all the time. And, and, uh, but for the most part, I, I just teach the Bible. So anyhow, we're teaching Galatians. We already started on a Wednesday, so it's not going to be a Sunday study. Uh, but we already introduced it last week just by reading the first two verses. Uh, let me read verses 1 through 5, because that's really the introduction to the book, even though uh, we actually won't cover verse, all the way down to verse 5 today, uh, pretty much just looking at verse 1. <laughs> but uh, again, it's, verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And, and verse 6 is, is I, I need to read that just for the sake of reminding you of what we ended with last time. And it's really the, the purpose of the book. It says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So Paul's going to be dealing with the Galatians. We talked about who the Galatians were. We talked about when the book was written. And, and the Galatians are the churches of Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, that Paul established in his first apostolic journey in chapters 13 and 14 of the book of Acts. And that he wrote it probably right at the end of Acts chapter 15 before he made his second visit to them to, uh, to go over things. And, and the reason I say that, there's so many things in Galatians that match the incident of Acts chapter 15. That, uh, it, and, and for him to, in this verse to say, I marvel that you're so soon removed. So we're, talk, we're not talking about Paul years later writing to the Galatians after he had been there. It was soon after he had been there that immediately uh, they, they were removed from the gospel. Uh, just for those of you who have been with us as we went through that Colossians 1.23 with great detail, do you remember how the verse kept saying, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel? And, uh, but there, I believe there's a difference between being moved away from the hope of the gospel. These people are actually being moved away from the gospel. The hope of the gospel is God's purpose in what he saved us for. It would include the gospel, but it would include the hope that's involved with the gospel. Here, the Galatians, they're just getting away from the gospel itself. 
And, uh, and as we closed last time, that's what I was pointing out to you, the, the importance of this book. It, it's centered around the gospel, the clarity and, and purity of the gospel. Uh, the word gospel itself is mentioned 12 times in the book of Galatians. If you look at Galatians chapter 1, we just already have it in verse 6 about being moved away. In verse 7 it says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Then in verse 8, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel. Verse 9, as we said before, so say now again, if any man preach any other gospel. <laughs> you realize Paul's mind's on the gospel. And, and then being moved away from the gospel. Verse 11 says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. So he continues to deal with the issue of the gospel. In chapter 2 of Galatians it says, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached um, uh, among the Gentiles. In verse 5 it says, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Verse 7, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me. Now you start getting into the details of uh, uh, what Paul's gospel is, or what it can, another title for Paul's gospel there, called the gospel of the uncircumcision. Uh, down in verse 14, it says, but when, I, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. So you realize when I talk about the, I guess maybe the biblical term would be the truth of the gospel, I said, I said the book is concerned with the purity and clarity of the gospel. Paul calls it the truth of the gospel in those verses. In, in chapter 3, in, in verse 8, he talks about the gospel was preached to Abraham, uh, and referring to something that was declared to Abraham. And then chapter 4, in verse 13, he says, uh, Ye know how that through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at, first, at the first. So, you realize the first couple chapters center around the gospel more. Uh, when we did a, a uh, not a survey, uh, what do we call it? Uh, I forget what we called it after we went through, after Acts. Uh, but anyhow, we reviewed the different books of Paul. In Galatians, there's two different ways to look at how, like if, you just, if you're reading it over and over, and you start looking for a pattern... There's a pattern where chapters 1 and 2 certainly center on the gospel. You could just see that in the verses we read. And then chapters 3 and 4 have to do with uh, uh, sanctification. That is, um, that, that after there's living by grace, being saved by grace and then living by grace. And then chapters 5 and 6 get into serving. And so... Uh, you have the gospel, and then sanctification, and then service. But when I keep reading it over and over, I, I found something interesting. The reason in chapter 3 that, it's, that most people switch from just being the basics of the gospel is because he, he asks the question, are you so foolish, chapter 3, verse 3, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And they start getting into the Christian life. But in your own reading, check out chapter 3 and see if chapter 3 still isn't centered around justification by faith. And, and the reason I say that, another outline then to the book of Galatians would be chapters 1 through 3 would be about the truth of the gospel. And then chapters 4 through 6 would be uh, uh, our service or actually it would be the first three chapters of salvation by grace and then uh, living by grace would be the last three chapters. And you'll see that the more practical about grace living is in chapters 4, 5, and 6. Um, but that's, you just keep reading it over and see which way you would outline the book yourself. But my point here is that the issue of the book centers around the gospel. And uh, that's extremely important because if you look at back to chapter 1, verse 7, when they're moved away from the gospel in verse 6, verse 7 declares, which is not another. You get, there is not another gospel. Uh, in fact, I would call the very beginning of, of, the, of, of the first study, of the first couple chapters, is salvation by grace. But chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, is the only gospel given to Gentiles. Um, <clears throat> but they're, when it says that they're moved away from the gospel, which is not another. If you move away from the gospel, you don't have salvation. You don't have a gospel message. There isn't another there is just the gospel of the grace of God. And, uh, and so it's, for them to be moved away from it is to, uh, um, 
retreat from the only thing that, that can save mankind. Now he talks about them beginning and, and so forth, so he's not dealing so much that there is no question about them losing their salvation, it's just that they're moving away from the gospel because some people have come in and perverted the gospel. Now as we introduce that, not only is that the issue here, but as you read through the book of Galatians, one thing that you'll see is that Paul's demeanor in his book, every epistle that he wrote, um, oh, like, like for instance, Romans, he's like a teacher. Ephesians, he's <laughs> up in the heavenly places. When you read Corinthians, he is discouraged. Uh, when you read Galatians, his demeanor is, is I don't want to say anger, <laughs> but you can uh, just say, you can put the adjective to that. You can see his demeanor by how he's dealing with this issue. When, like, just declaring that... Uh, uh, about the gospel, like in verse 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed. That's not a very, <coughs> you know, nice thing to say. <laughs> like, how, <laughs> well, anyhow, you already heard me read Galatians 3. Oh, foolish Galatians. I mean, you get the idea that, that moving away from the gospel is a serious issue. And Paul's like, not only just shocked about it, uh, he, he is actually angered by it. To the point that uh, verse 7 says, uh, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, I see this as he's express, expressing his disappointment that they're listening to false teachers. Yeah. Yeah, that they would, yeah. <laughs> you think disappointment's a strong enough word? <laughs> look, look, at, look at verse 8. Though we are an angel, uh, preach any other gospel unto you, uh, angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. <laughs> As we said before, so say now again. You've got to repeat it. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Uh, strong, strong language. Paul's, he's angered uh, about someone that would pervert and people that would move away from the gospel of the grace of God. And uh, it, it just keeps showing up over and over. Go to chapter 2 and verse 4. When he talks about these people, later on we'll give them a title of Judaizers, but the, the Bible doesn't actually call them that. Uh, that's a term that we give them and we'll define the term because their, their name is actually, it's not so much Judaizers, it's what, what they're teaching. Like verse chapter 2 verse 4. Uh, and they're... Uh, and that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privately, privily, to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us uh, into bondage. Again, into bondage. I mean, he's talking about false brethren. They crept in unawares. Uh, you look at them almost like in Philippians verse that we talk about the enemies of Christ, or the enemies of the cross. Uh, down in verse 11, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. I mean, when Peter backed off of his understanding of the grace of God and, and, and what he did there, I mean, Paul's talking pretty tough language there. And then at verse 21 of chapter 2, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And uh, you know, that's, that's pretty strong language, but... That's a pretty dangerous thing when somebody substitute the cross work of Christ for something else. When Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, I always thought frustrate like is uh, irritating. But that's not really the definition of frustrate. Frustrate actually means to neutralize. Frustrate is like uh, if something is going one way and something is hindering it, it's frustrating it. And so... When he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, he's talking about someone who neutralizes the grace of God, voids the grace of God, disannuls the grace of God, works against the gospel. And uh, that's what that frustrate means, because if there was another way to be righteous before God, other than through the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and faith alone in that, because you'll see faith is, I forget how many times it, the word faith is used throughout the book of Galatians, the whole point is, is that we're justified by faith and not by works of the law. That's chapter 2, verse 16 there, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. The point is, is the people who are putting works, circumcision, keeping the law, 
that they're frustrating the grace of God, and if salvation could have come that way, then Christ died in vain. But the Paul talking about it frustrating, using that term, it's, it's strong language. They're fighting words is what the point is. Chapter 3 and verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? That's the, he just, when he says bewitched you there, he's actually talking about it as if it's satanic. And there's no doubt Satan's the one who, 2 Corinthians tells us, blinds the minds of those who have not believed, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. So he's going to be perverting the message, and, and lo and behold, the, the Galatians are listening to it and, and, and being drawn away, being removed from the hope, or re, being removed from the gospel. Down in verse uh, chapter 3 and verse uh, 10, it says... Uh, and these are the people bringing in the law. For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So, not only satanic, but there's a curse involved in that. And then, when you get to chapter 4, verse 9, it says, uh, uh, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? He calls it weak. In uh, verse 11, he, call, he says, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So, uh, them turning away just nullifies Paul's ministry with them. Verse 20 says, I desire to be present with you now that I may change my voice. For I stand in doubt of you. You see the demeanor? You can actually, Paul is irritated, angry, and fighting for the hope and the truth, or not the hope, but for the truth of the gospel. Chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, uh, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Now there's excommunication in, the, in one sense, and he probably says it in such a way that it's uh, uh, got a physical implication as well. Um, chapter 6 and verse 11, it says, uh, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. Now that's got to be impressive, because this is the only epistle by Paul that was actually penned by him. If you remember, like in the end of the book of uh, Romans, Paul writes, or not Paul writes, it says, I, Tertullius, who wrote this epistle, salute you. But the epistle starts out, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and as if the, the letter, and then, you know, chapter 11, verse 13, uh, Paul says, I am the apostle of Gentiles. I magnify my office. I speak unto you Gentiles. So all of a sudden you get to the end of the book and it says, I, Tertullius, who wrote this epistle. Well, Tertullius is not the author of the epistle. He's the penman. Paul dictated, that, cause that's 16 chapters in the book of Romans. But here, all six chapters of the book of Galatians were penned by the Apostle Paul. When he talks about how large of a letter, he's certainly not talking about a long letter. He's talking about probably, you see in Galatians, he probably had bad eyesight. And so he's writing with large letters. And, uh, and, and that's what he's referring to there. He wrote it with his own hands. That just tells you how urgent this was for Paul to get this letter to the Galatians uh, because of the, the importance of the truth of the gospel, that the truth of the gospel might continue with them. Verse 12 says, For as many, I'm in chapter 6, For as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. And you see, the cross is the issue. Uh, the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ being the issue there, and, and Him suffering for that. And we, we covered this last week, but look again at verse 17. He says, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Now, if you remember last week, we said that right after, right after he had visited these places, when he was in Lystra, he was stoned to death. They thought they killed him. And, and then, you know, that's the end of uh, chapter 14. He backtracks. Chapter 15, he's at that council of Jerusalem. When that's all over, he spends some time at Antioch, and that's probably what he wrote to Galatians. And he probably still has some marks in his body from those times. Of course, they're probably permanent scars. So, but, but that statement, from henceforth, no, let no man trouble me. Like, he's not putting up with those guys, these false brethren who crept in unaware, uh, these who pervert the gospel of Christ. Don't let them trouble me. He suffers for the cross of Christ. They don't suffer for the cross of Christ. 
They want to promote man and man's works and man's efforts. So this is a serious issue when it comes to the gospel. And you can see Paul's demeanor in that. That's just kind of giving you an overview of where the book's going to go just because chapter 1 verse 6 kind of... Uh, Paul gets right to it, what the heart of the problem is and why he wrote that. Now, I closed last week by getting to this point to talk to you about the importance of the clarity, purity of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. That's a better way of saying it. So, But anyhow, I said to you that there is a famous preacher out there, has a whole cathedral filled of people, and uh, actually it's a, what, a basketball gymnasium, a basketball stadium. Anyhow... I didn't quote, say his name because I wanted to make sure I quoted him exactly because I've heard him give the gospel several times, which is not a gospel. I'm talking about Joel Olstein. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wrote it down, quote, here's Joel Olstein's invitation of the gospel. He says, he says, repeat after me, he says, to say this, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins, come into my heart, wash me in your blood, he come close there, I make you my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer, you're saved. Now, he, like I said, he came close, wash me in your blood. But it doesn't say anything about Jesus Christ dying and paying for your sins and rising for your justification. It has no cross in there at all. It, it's, especially when he starts out, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Oh, Yeah. Can you imagine telling the Lord you repent of your sins? Yeah, you might get rid of some sins. You're not going to repent of your sins. In fact, I started looking at, where in the Bible does it say repent of your sins? It does say in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. But there, repent, Peter is telling you, you just killed, you just killed Christ. You better change your mind about who you think he is because God just made him Lord and Christ. He's going to judge her. He's going to save you. And that message still centered around the fact that they didn't understand the purpose of the death, burial, and resurrection. They're still under John's baptism. So it's repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. But where in the Bible does it say, God will save you if you repent of your sins? And if we had to repent of our sins to get saved, none of us would ever get saved. And you realize how everybody says that. that that's, that's preached everywhere. Repent is a change of mind. And what you need to change your mind about is you can't save yourself. That you're a sinner deserving to go to hell. Most people don't think that. And then you can't save yourself, but there's one who can save you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, repent of your sins and then come into my heart. It's like a Sunday, little Sunday school thing there. Uh, God just doesn't come into someone's heart. He's got to save them before he's ever going to enter into them. And, but then he'll come into my heart, wash me in your blood. He knew to throw the blood in there, and that would probably make people happy there. And then I make you my Lord and my Savior. Now, I, I don't think you make him anything. <laughs> he, he is who he is, <laughs> and when you trust him, he becomes your Lord and your Savior. But uh, anyhow, that, that's his statement. And I, I just point out to you that, you know, he just tells people constantly, if you say that, you're saved, and you can say that all you want, you're not saved. None of that is the gospel that Paul talked about. He might talk about the blood, but like I say, there's not enough. Wash me in your blood doesn't mean I trust Jesus Christ who died on the cross and paid for my sins. It doesn't mean that. Um, at least it doesn't say that. And it, it doesn't. Anyhow, Jim, the other thing, Jim told me something yesterday that I, I couldn't hardly believe. I asked him to verify it, but I didn't wait for him. I went and verified it myself. And that is that Rick Warren, Saddleback Church, is that what it's called? Yep. That... He actually had a, a, he went to a Catholic thing, and I guess several of the Protestants went to this, and, uh, but he, he made a declaration concerning Catholicism and Protestantism. In fact, I have the exact quote to make sure that, because <laughs> when Jim told me what he said, I just couldn't believe it. This what it, just jumping through the quote, here's, here's, these are his words. It says, when you talk about Protestant, Charismatic, Evangelicals, Fundamentals, Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterian. Well, they all say we believe in the Trinity. We believe in the Bible. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in salvation through Jesus Christ. These are the big issues. 
So like what he's saying, there's no big difference between Catholics and Protestants and all the different divisions of Protestantism. He, he goes on to say, he says, there's still, uh, there's still real differences, no doubt about that, but the most important thing is if, if we love Jesus, we're all on the same team. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Even, even when you go back to, you know, we all believe in the Trinity. So, uh, I'll give that one. We believe in the Bible. Well, I don't believe that's true. There's people that change the Bible constantly. We believe in the resurrection. And there's a good part of whether you're uh, not, not, not even to deal with the Catholic issue. All kinds of different so-called Methodists, Presbyterian or, you know, these mainline denominations, Protestant denominations, there's many of them to deny the, the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But anyhow, we believe in salvation through Jesus Christ. Well, not through Jesus Christ alone. Not through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. No Catholic believing Catholicism believes that it's sufficient just to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to be saved. That's not Catholic doctrine. And that's not doctrine of some of the Protestant churches. And, and then to say, if we all just love Jesus, we're on the same team. Don't put me on that team. Because Paul, the reason I read those things about the demeanor, Paul would not say those things concerning Catholicism that denies the, 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 the complete work at Calvary. They frustrate the grace of God. And, and, you know, and these other denominations, they don't push for the clarity of the gospel, saying 1 Corinthians 15 is the simplicity of it all, how that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul said in verse 2 of Galatians chapter 15 that you're saved if you believe that, and if you don't believe that, then, then you're not saved. So that the gospel centers around the cross work of Christ and our faith in what Jesus Christ did, that substitutionary payment that he made for us on the cross. And, and anything other than that is going to frustrate any work of repentance that you do, any baptism that you do in order to gain God's favor, any aisle walk that you do, confessing your sins. All those things, none of those things save you. Those are just things you do, but that's not things that, that God accepts you on the basis of. God only accepts you on the basis of what Jesus Christ did for you, and when you realize, I can't save myself, I'll trust what God, Christ has done. In fact, go back to Galatians 1. Notice in verse 6, it says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So he, call, he calls it there the grace of Christ. Then he says in verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is the grace of Christ. Now think about that. We, we talk about frustra frustrating. That frustrating is something that prevents something from happening. Can you quote me a Romans 11.6? If by grace... Then it is no more works, otherwise grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, then it is not of grace, otherwise work is no more work. Makes it real clear, work frustrates grace. Grace is a free gift given to you based on what someone else did for you. And, 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 the, and verse 6 calls it, he doesn't even call it the grace, uh, the gospel right away, or the gospel of grace. He calls it the grace of Christ. Because grace is found in Jesus Christ. Through, he died for us. It's that substitutionary payment. And uh, so my, my point is, is, I can catch Paul's demeanor on, when it comes to the gospel. That, that unclear gospel. There's a track. I pulled it off our track rack. Someone tried to copy our way of, am I going to heaven? And, uh, and on the back of it, it says, Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner. Good. I cannot go to heaven based upon my works. Great. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ uh, to pay the, pen the punishment for my sins by dying on the cross, then ra raising to life again. I turn now from my sins and receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Why did they throw that in there? 
Everything he said was perfect. Believing you're a sinner, the only way to get saved, Jesus died and paid the penalty of your sins, and now to, it becomes a bargain with God. I turn from my sins and receive Christ, uh, the Lord Jesus, as, uh, Christ as my Lord and Savior. Sometimes, by the way, Lord and Savior gets to be a confusing thing. Because some people, like John MacArthur, says that salvation is not just believing Jesus Christ is your Savior, it's believing that He's your Lord. And if you don't make Him Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. And that's called Lordship salvation. That when you trust Jesus Christ, now He'll be real good on the Gospel, the substitutionary payment, but when He says make, you have to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He's throwing those works in there that you're going to make sure that Jesus is Lord of your life. You know, I don't think people are honest myself. In, in the sense, like if you say, I repent of my sins. You might as well be honest to God. Say, I will repent of some of my sins, but I, I couldn't possibly get repent of them all. Can you imagine saying, I make Jesus Lord of my life? And he, has Lord, he, he, has, he has Lordship. He is Lord. You don't make Him Lord. He is Lord. But you would submit to His Lordship in various degrees. Hopefully you could grow to the point where 100% of your life. But I don't think there's a man living that has done that. That's why I say I don't think people are honest. You know, we might make him Lord. We're going to be here on Sunday and Wednesday. And we're going to study our Bible every day. And we're going to pray. But I like a football game once in a while. I'm not going to make him Lord there. That's, you know. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, I, that's, to me, all that is frustrating the grace of God. That's all. That, I did, Let's get into the book of Galatians, where are we at here? <laughs> Let's go to actual study of the book of Galatians. Watch how this book begins. It says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, if you're familiar with Paul's epistles, every one of Paul's epistles begin with his name, identifying who he is. And when you get into the epistles... And not the historical New Testament books, but the epistles. James starts out with his name. Peter starts out with his name. Interestingly, John never starts out with his name. Not only in the gospel, even 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, it doesn't say John. Uh, in the book of Revelation, it'll say John. But uh, those other books don't. And, and uh, uh, I better bite my tongue. And anyhow, the, uh, John doesn't, but... Uh, Oh, Jude was the other person. He identifies his writing. So Paul is identifying himself as the, the writer here, but not just his name, his identity, his credentials. Paul, an apostle. And, uh, and that, that's something that's taken too lightly and, and used too lightly. An apostle, as we're going to see as we go on through this chapter, is that apostle is one appointed by Jesus Christ, sent from Jesus Christ with a message. And that message is going to be an important part here. When he says, when he gives his name and his apostleship, apparently Paul, an apostle, that's an important thing. Let me show you. Look at chapter 2 and verse 8. He said, For he that wrought effectually in Peter, and we're talking about God, to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So Paul, an apostle... He's that by the effectual working of God. So it means something when he says Paul an apostle. It's identifying who he is, but his, his credentials. He's an apostle sent by Jesus Christ. And, and, and not only that, <laughs> if you don't understand the importance of that, you'd never understand this verse. Come over to chapter 5. Look at verse 2. Behold... I, Paul, say unto you, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. If, it, if Paul didn't have some special credentials, who is he to say, I, Paul, say unto you? But if he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it's Paul the apostle because he's the apostle to the Gentiles, and he says it unto you Gentiles, now that means something. He's speaking with apostolic authority. And, and so when he starts out, Paul, an apostle, that's just not uh, like, hello, I'm Tom, writing you a letter. This is, he, he's stating who he is because who is Paul? Well, he's immediately going to emphasize his apostleship. 
And, uh, it, but when I, he's going to immediately emphasize not only his apostleship, but the point is, is that he is the apostle of the Gentiles. And so what he has a right is going to be God's word to us. It's, it's this knowledge of who Paul is, that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, that, that has caused the problem that exists at Galatia. At Galatia. That verse 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you. Because those other brethren came in, false brethren, and said something other than Paul? Well, no wonder he says, though we are an angel from heaven. Or if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Because the message God has for us was sent by Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. And if somebody says something else, let him be accursed. So that, if, what I'm saying is, is that the church today, the body of Christ, has not recognized why these epistles start out Paul an apostle. They don't know who their apostle is. They don't think that that means anything different than when Peter says that he's Peter and he's writing to the circumcision. They don't think that makes any difference. As a result of that, you have, the, you have competing gospel messages. You, the reason for that, you'll have the perversion of the gospel. You have, you have we were talking about, why so many churches? If, if all the churches would, there'd still be division, because we can argue over all kinds of stuff. But, but the majority of the problem, and certainly the, the different, all the different churches exist, because they have not recognized who their apostle is, and what is their message from God. They've just taken it from different parts of the Bible, and so some like water baptism, like the Church of Christ, and they're going to be followers of John the Baptist, and the Catholics are going to make Peter their first pope and follow him. But all of that is a total disregard for why Paul's epistles start out Paul an apostle. And when they understood that those are important words because it identifies who he is, well, he's the apostle of the Gentiles, so now this book belongs to me. And if he's an apostle, this is not his words, these are the words of Jesus Christ to me. And then now, now, okay, all we got to do is start believing what Paul said to us, we'd be in unity. That's called the unity of faith, by the way. So, anyhow, so Paul, when he starts out here identifying himself, there's an important reason for that. And, uh, um, and, and also, when I say it's an important reason for that, it's not just me saying it. Notice there's a parenthesis right after that, that ends at the end of the verse. So when he says he's Paul, an apostle, now he's going to tell you why that's important. Not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. There's a lot of little details there. For instance, when he says, not of men, the origin of Paul's apostleship didn't originate with humans. And notice there's a difference. He says, not of men, and then it says, neither by man. So you got men and man. So the, the very origin of his apostleship was not on a human level. Men. They didn't appoint him an apostle. Uh, you, you see that kind of emphasized. Look at chapter 2 and verse 6. Now here, here's a group of men. And these are proper men. These are Peter, James, John, the elders of Jerusalem church. It says, But they who seemed to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. <laughs> uh, God accepts no man's persons. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. So here's a group of men. Those group of men, even those godly men, didn't make Paul an apostle. He's not an apostle of men. His origin isn't from humans. He says, neither by man. Now, when he says, neither by man, um, it's that he's making it clear that not only is it not of human origin, no man made him an apostle. Now, one man or a group of men made him apostle. That's, that's something to be considered. Well, watch this. Come back to Acts chapter 1. I want to say this incorrectly because it's cl what I'm saying is going to be close to saying something incorrectly. I just got to I'll just make sure I clarify what I'm saying. In Acts chapter 1, verse 21. Now Peter stands up, Jesus Christ has ascended back into heaven, they're waiting for the Holy Ghost to come, but Judas had went out and hung himself, he just got done talking about that. He says in verse 21, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied us, 
Acts 1, 21, who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be, an, uh, be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph, called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they, gave, and they prayed and said, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast chosen, and that, that, we, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, uh, that, he might, that, that he might go uh, to his place. And they cast forth their lots, and the lots fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. So, by the way, a lot of people say, that they were all wrong in doing this, that Paul replaced them, but I'm not even going to go there. The, the point is, is here some men are appointing a, uh, Matthias as the, as the next apostle, isn't it? There, there, there is a sense in which they looked over the group and said, you know, there's only two people qualified to be one of us. But then the clarification is they asked the Lord, who did you choose? And when the lots fell on Matthias, they took that as God declaring Matthias to be the, the apostle to replace Judas. So he's really chosen by their prayer. He's chosen by Jesus Christ. But these men were involved in his appointment, weren't they? Paul says that I'm apostle, not of men, neither by man. That didn't come that way. And uh, so when, when you say, come over to Corinthians with me. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. No, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 is where I want you to go. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Now certainly, by looking at Galatians 2, you realize those were godly men that Paul said, whatever they were, it makes no matter to me. I mean, if, if you met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and he appointed you to be apostle, you wouldn't care who's saying who's who in Jerusalem. You wouldn't even care who Peter is. You know, Jesus Christ. It wasn't of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ. So Paul doesn't care about those men, but although those are godly men, even Acts 1, those are godly men here. And Matthias, they were involved in choosing him or his place, taking his part as an apostle. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, down in verse 13, notice this. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So when Paul says, not of men, neither by man, it's not godly men, and it's certainly not religious men. But later in Galatians 2, he's going to talk about how he excelled above many of his own equals, and of his own nation. And certainly those are ungodly people that he's, he's, going to, he's going to speak about them. But here he warns about, there's people who appoint themselves as apostles. Paul said, I'm not that kind of apostle. <laughs> My apostleship is... Is not of men, neither by man. And it's certainly not himself pointing himself an apostle. By the way, the apostolic church, you ever see the big signs where the, they, got, they usually have pretty long names, but they always have apostolic in there. They call their ministers, they don't call them elders or pastors or deacon or anything, they call their, their leadership apostles. Every one of them are appointed by man. You know, why I, you know how I know that? Is Jesus Christ is in heaven. He's not pointing anybody else. In fact, I'll show you a verse in just a... Well, it's right here. Go, back, go look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says in verse... He's he talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, like in verse 7, he says, he's naming all the times that Christ appeared after his resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Now, that's the 12 apostles. Last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time, for I am least of the apostles. I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am. 
Paul says, last of all, he was seen of me. Did Jesus Christ appear after Paul to someone else to make them an apostle? Or is the Bible tell you that the last one to appear to, uh, to appear and appoint apostle is, is Jesus Christ appearing to Paul? That he's the last. There's no apostles after Paul. Now there is apostles in a secondary sense in which Paul tells to Timothy, uh, stir up the gift that is given thee by the laying on, on of my hands. Or as he says, uh, by the presbytery and the prophecies that went before thee. That is, Timothy is an apostle. The church, the body of Christ, has apostles. There's people that have been appointed through prophetic utterance when God was giving prophecy, when God was speaking apart from the Bible, before the Bible was complete. God told Timothy, Paul didn't just decide, I think I'll make him an apostle. <laughs> There's a prophecy that God said to Timothy, lay your hands on him and make him an apostle with you. So he's like a secondary apostle. So there were apostles that way. But with the end of prophecy... And the last person to actually see Jesus Christ in resurrection is Paul. There is no more apostles today. So that these people, the apostolic church, that's all self-appointed. Paul said, I'm not one of them. The succession of popes by the Catholic church. Thinking they, they can choose who the next pope is and all of that. That's, that's of men. That's not of God. And then, then you have the Mormonism, Mormons. They do the same. They appoint apostles. All that appointment of men. Paul was the last one appointed by Jesus Christ to be an apostle, and he's an apostle of the Gentiles. In fact, you still in 1 Corinthians? Look back at chapter 9. <laughs> Look at this. Verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? Are ye, not, uh, uh, are ye not my work in the Lord? See, when he says, I'm an apostle, and then he says, Have I not seen the, uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord? He, he saw Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ appointed him and made him an apostle. An apostle is one sent directly by Jesus Christ. There's some secondary apostles because of the prophecies that go before. But Paul was the last one directly appointed by Jesus Christ as an apostle. If you go back to Luke chapter 6, Jesus comes down and he says, uh, I forget how it words, but anyhow, among his disciples he chose 12 to be his apostles. So Jesus Christ, the 12 apostles, and it'll give their names, and then Judas died, and then we read, just read when Matthias replaced him. How do we know who the twelve apostles are? God's word tells us their name. How do we know Paul's an apostle? God's word says Paul's an apostle. So these other people who are self-appointed, how do you know they're apostles? Well, first of all, I know they're not, because they're appointed by men. The last one appointed was, was Paul by God. So when he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, uh, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ. So that uh, Paul's apostleship is directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what a true apostle is. An apostle is sent by one with Jesus Christ. But an apostle, when he's sent by Jesus Christ, it's not just to do something, it's to reveal something. So Paul's message is, that's why I say, the book of Galatians is going to, is going to be a, a declaration of the grace that was given to Paul for us Gentiles that others came in to frustrate. And, uh, and those other people don't have the credentials of Paul and they shouldn't have been followed. So the, 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 the introduction to this book is really important that it's by Jesus Christ. And certainly, uh, hopefully you, you're already familiar with the fact that the Apostle Paul, that Jesus Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And I'll read the verse next week for you. But called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. I'll make sure we start there next week. I just wanted to say a couple things and then we'll actually verify it next week. Because we didn't finish chapter one, verse 1 there. He's an apostle not of men, neither by man, but it's by Jesus Christ. And that's going to take place on the road to Damascus. And it says, and by God the Father. So that... One of the things you need to realize is that Jesus Christ, even himself, is not acting on his own will. But that he appointed Paul to be an apostle by the will of God the Father. 
And then it, why did he throw in who raised him from the dead? That's, that's somehow associated with Paul's apostleship. And one of the things, that we'll look at the verses next week, but the thing that's obvious from that is Paul's the only one appointed as apostle after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, directly by Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus. And, uh, and that's an important thing to know because it's on that road to Damascus that Paul's message of the gospel was given to him for us. And uh, so we'll, we'll look at that later and be reminded of the importance of that. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the authority of your Bible. And we thank you that it's not all just kindness. We remember the Lord Jesus overthrowing the money changers. Uh, we remember him dealing with the Pharisees and Sadducees and directly calling them hypocrites right to their face. Father, the truth of your word is really important. The truth of the gospel, the work of your Son, your grace, the cross work of Christ. Uh, those are important issues. Justification by faith alone is something really important and not something we should just take lightly that people say gospel and, and use their own terms and their own expressions that, are, that are, are not directly your word and your promise of the gospel. Father, I pray that it would trouble all of us that we would understand the most simplistic, simple thing in the world, the gospel, uh, but it's the most perverted thing in the world, too, by, by sometimes people that, that have good intentions but just are not staying biblical. Father, help us to, to value the clarity and purity of the gospel, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.